Okay, this is our speaker for tonight for Small Tony Mary Lerman. And he knows a lot about bottles and no, stuff no, like no, that. No, that's fine. That's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me here. I haven't done a lot of public speaking, but enough to get by, so I can I started collecting bottles by accident, I, probably like everybody else does. I don't know how many are bottle collectors in here, but it's a very interesting hobby because there's a lot of history involved in, in the bottle industry. Uh, bottle making came to this area in the 1800s. Uh, bottles came to this area in the 1700s. Bottles came to America in the 1600s. So there's potential for finding stuff from even prior to the 1600s because they started bringing stuff here in the 1600s and, and creating bottles. Uh, dating bottles is very easy to get you a rough idea of where they're from, what period they're from, what era they're from. Uh, getting an exact date is a little bit tougher. You have to sort of search the history of the company that made the bottle or the manufacturer of the product in the bottle to find out uh, the exact date on something. Uh, some of the bottles I have here, I just threw some samples together real quick and I didn't bring a lot of big ones because they're a little harder to carry, so I took some of the smaller ones. Uh, if you're buying bottles, you have to be careful because there's a lot of replica bottles out there that are out there, basically, some are out there to fool people and some are out there just because they like to make a replica bottle and they're not really there. You can tell the difference in them because they make them so that you can tell they're replica. These, are, these two are replica bottles. These two small ones, these are made by the wheat company, but they're still collectible. They still make only a limited amount of them, so they still have some value. These have uh, presidents on the front of them embossed, and they're tiny little shelf collector bottles. And they also make a bottle like this uh, that came out, I think it was made by Pine Sol, and they had the presidents embossed on them just like this. They look just like this, only in a bigger variety. They're about this big. Uh, I have some, some rare bottles here, but nothing of great, great value. Uh, this is a poison bottle. And you'll find one, one thing they did was uh, they made them put little ribs on the sides of poison bottles for the blind people so that they could tell what they were touching. And like a square poison bottle will have ribs all across the front so that when they touch it, they can feel that it's a poison bottle. And that's a unique thing about, about a, a bottle. It's, and these are you know, relatively old. Like this is the, the old port one, but it's probably around a 1910 bottle, somewhere around there. Uh, bottles were blown in molds, and they were bl blown hand-free. Uh, glass blowers came in, and, and they blew them on, a, on a, their big pipes that they had. And uh, prior to 18, I would say 1860, they, I think it was, no, actually it was prior to 1850, they had uh, no way of really cutting the, holding the bottles to shape them. So when they blew them, they had to, they, they'd only blow a bottle up to about this far. They'd make that bottom portion of the bottle. And then they would make the neck separate and they would make the top separate. So they would apply a neck, and then they would apply a, a, a top. That was prior to 1850. And when they used to blow them, they'd have the, the tube on the bottom. And what it's called, it's called a pongo. <coughs> and they had no way of really doing a good job of getting that tube off and to the pongo that held them while they were blowing. And it, it was like a steel rod, and they just used to break it off and there'd be a big hole in the bottom of the bottle and it'd be indented in and I don't have anything that has that. I have some that have a pontal mark on them but they don't have the one that we're looking for. And I don't think I even owned one that that old prior to 1850. I do have, here's, here's a, a little bit of an example. This is a pontal mark, you'll see a, a hole in the bottom of the bottle where it's round. Now that is a pontal mark from when they held it while they blew it. Now you can pass this around and look at it, but this is a newer pontal mark compared to the one I'm looking for. Look, we're talking about in the 1850s. 
1850s will have it like almost like a you put your finger in the bottom. It'll be that kind of a hole and it'll be a jagged edge because they break it right out. Sharp. But this is a, a little bit newer. This is this is newer than 1850. Excuse me a minute, Bruce. Mm -hmm. We normally get the speaker to speak a little bit, warm up the audience, and then we have a bladder break, let everybody go to the bathroom, whatever you want. We also have pizza and soda over here, so it sort of relaxes everybody. So we can take a 15-minute pizza, soda break, bladder break, whatever you want, and then we'll get right back. We'll talk to the speaker if that's what you want to do. So we can all break or take a pizza break here if you want it. It's free and soda over here, and then we'll come right back, okay? Nobody's moving, but that's what we want you to do. <laughs> Doing that for a year, but all the meetings are in New York, so I didn't I didn't keep my membership up because they don't do anything in the Upper Valley. And I talked about trying to form a bottle club up in this area, uh, put a few flyers out, put something in the paper, but we didn't get much of a response. So it wasn't worth our aggravation to do it. But uh, there are a lot of bottle club collectors in the area. Uh, there's a guy from West Strand who wrote uh, he wrote a, a book on beer breweries in the area, and he's a big bottle collector. He was a teacher at West Grand, Nick Matula. And uh, he was going to come tonight, but it's his daughter's birthday. I invited him to come along because he has, he has a lot of lot more knowledge than I do as far as bottles. He, he's a big, serious, serious collector. Uh, we went, we go on a couple of digs together whenever we can. And, uh, there's, there's a lot of good places to still find bottles. I mean, the problem is getting permission from the landowners to go in there and do it. But old farmhouses behind the old farmhouse when you see them tearing down a building when, when they're excavating sewer lines and water lines. I found in Duryea a peach basket after peach basket full of bottles. We were digging for uh, storm drains in there. I just kept digging them out and setting them on the side and telling the guys, leave them alone, don't touch them, I'll pick them up later. And I just kept digging and put them in baskets on lunchtime and carrying them home. Uh, bottles to date them by the way they were made back going back to the way they were blown is like I, I spoke about they blow the, the bottom part of the bottle to this point they shear it off and then they blow this point and put it on and then they put the top on that was uh, about around the 1860 period and then you'll see that there's a seam in it and the seam goes up it goes right through the neck and that would date it up a little higher towards 1880 and then you'll find that the seam goes right up through and right through the top of the bottle. If it goes right through the top of the bottle, that was made after 1903. 1903 is when they made the full mold where, where they fold the bottle, the mold up together and blow the glass right in the mold and open the mold back up. And that's why you'll have that line on there. Now this bottle is a, this is an expensive bottle, a very uh, rare bottle, but not, not, to the point where it's valuable enough that I wouldn't have to worry about carrying around with me. But this is an 1800s bottle from Hyde Park and Strand. It's Morris Jewel. Uh, I also have a Schrade bottle, which has a little bottle embossed right on the top of it. And there was people advertising probably about 10 or 15 years ago when the Strand Times they were paying $100 a bottle. And that was 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, I think it's J.W. J. Schrade. Or Schrader, sometimes it's, it's extended, the name changed. But you'll see that on, on different bottles where people change the name on it. Or, uh, well, it's just like, like people who came to the country change their name, they add a little syllable here and there. Um, you'll, you'll see breweries that have changed hands three and four times, where the, where the same bottle, exact same bottle, will have three, four different names on it. You'll know it's the same bottle made in the same place, but the brewery just changed and then they just changed the embossing. Uh, this is prior to 1860, this bottle, so this is you know, before the Civil War. Um, this one came from London, England. This is a gin bottle, Gordon's Gin from London, England. It has a nice little emboss on the bottom of a dragon or something. And this one was made prior to the 1900s. It's an 1800s bottle, 18. 70, 1880, in that period there. And this one here is a, what they call a 10-pin bottle. And these are made 
<coughs> so that whatever was inside them, the cork stayed wet. So it had wine in it or it had some kind of effervescence that needed to have the cork moist all the time so the cork wouldn't leak. And they laid these down. They had little holders that they made for them so you could set them in a holder. And this is called a 10 pin bottle. And these were made in the 1800s too. Uh, in fact, this one is probably around 18. 1780 in that area. Uh, this is a replica bottle, I'm pretty sure. Uh, these are figural bottles that they made. They make all kinds of things. Uh, they're very old bottles of pigs that are, are like an amber color or a pinkish uh, type glass that are uh, pretty rare. Now this one, I, I'm not positive. I, I bought this at a yard sale someplace and I really can't date it because made so many replicas and I had never seen another one so I'm just holding on to it hoping I can find more out about it. Uh, these bottles of course are collectible bottles but they're they're not blown like the, like the older style. These are Avon bottles. Um, Avon makes all kinds of collectible bottles and they have a lot of value. The bottles make, like this is like a $10 bottle, $5 bottle depending on who you're buying it from. Uh, if you have the box it's worth a lot more. We have the original box. This is a Thunderbird. This was a man's cologne. Take the back off, and the cologne is still in there. And that comes with the box. That makes it a little bit more valuable. Uh, if it was a $10 bottle with the box, you could get $15 or $20 for it. Uh, any one of these bottles would bring a dollar, two dollars, to five dollars, to ten dollars, depending on the scarcity of the bottle. Uh, Bromo seltzer bottles are very common in this area. They're cobalt blue bottles because the miners use this the Bromo seltzer when they were in the mines. It's a very common bottle. You find them all over the place. But there's different uh, different uh, eras where they were made. Uh, this one here was at after the turn of the century. This one here has a screw top, which was in the 20s and 30s. This one here is the older version, which is probably 1870s, somewhere around there. They're all Romo seltzer bottles. This one would be worth a lot more, I think, in the book. Uh, it might be $25 or $30 for a bottle like that. Bottles with the labels on bring more money. This is an old castor oil bottle. And this is from around 1910, 1915, somewhere in that era. There's bottles like this with the uh, dye in it. And there's ink bottles, there's shoe polish bottles. They, you'll find them a lot in old buildings that's still sitting on a beam someplace and they have the label. There's a lot of them so they don't bring a lot of money. These are old patent medicine bottles. Um, this one's from New York. It's a pain expeller. It's got a little anchor on it. It tells you where it's from, where it's made. and. Uh, the seams on these usually run right up along the edge. If you're looking for a seam, they'll run along the edge of the bottle and up through the neck. And you can tell the, the date by those. Glass milk bottles are very collectible. There's a lot of people look for milk bottles. I had a guy from Binghamton come to my house uh, probably 10, 15 years ago and offered me $150 for a milk bottle. I, I walked, he came in, he says, how much you want for that? I said, oh, I'll give you $150 for it. He was, was that, he was that willing. I what said, was it? It was a Binghamton milk bottle. Yeah, I have it. Oh, I can't remember oh. exactly. Did you tell him you trade for a bottle of Kilmer Swamp? I have Kilmer. I have Kilmer Swamp. Yeah, I have Father John's Medicine, Kilmer Swamp Root, uh, Paint Expellers. Uh, there's uh, so many names. In fact, in here, there's an article in here about that. Let's see if I can find it. <coughs> lady wrote an article in one of these magazines, I was looking at it the other day. These are very interesting. Some of these will tell you about the glass pipes and, and things that they made. It was made from glass rolling pins. Uh, they, they made them look just like a rolling pin. They put liquid in them. And some of that, some of the reason for doing that was to bring liquor into the country. Uh, they made the roll, glass rolling pins and they filled them with liquor and put the 
the corks in them, and then they brought them in as as bottles, collectible bottles, but then they had the liquor inside them. And, and so that was part of their way of getting it into the country. But there's a lot of interesting things, like this is an old Moxie soda bottle with the spray. It doesn't work anymore, but that's for soda from a soda fountain. This one here is uh, Rochester Germicide Company from Rochester, New York, patented January 25, 1888. And uh, that's upside down. That's the way it was written on there. Probably was one of the bottles that they laid down. This is a creamer, sour cream bottle. Uh, milk bottles came in pints, quarts, half pints, little cream bottles. They had the old milk, milk bottles had the cream tops. They're very collectible. There's a lot more of them. The baby face, there's milk bottles with a baby face on the cream top on the top. They're really expensive and highly collectible. Even some of the bottles like you have on the table with the uh, Penn State on them, Coca-Cola bottles, Pepsi bottles, uh, they're collectible. I mean, they're not a lot. I mean, they're NASCAR bottles are very collectible now. I and mean, NASCAR has only been popular for the last 10 or 15 years, which really exploded. I mean, I, it was popular with me when I was a kid. But uh, now I have, I have Richard Petty bottles, and I have some Dale Earnhardt Coke bottles. They're getting $10 a piece for the bottles, and you can buy a whole six-pack for $1.98 or $1.50 when they came out. So, you know, anything like that, Joe Paterno Penn State bottle, if you got it, you bought it for, you know, 90 cents or 80 cents or something like that. When you bought it in a six-pack, right now it's probably a $5 bottle or something. So it's always worth hanging on to anything. Are there any questions anybody has on anything? Anybody have any bottles, any questions on or want to know the dates about anything? Candy containers. Candy containers? They, I, I don't see a lot of them. They're rare. Pictures in here of some glass candy containers. People that, are, that don't know what he's talking about. These are the candy containers right here. They made them like little fire trucks and trains and lunch boxes and just about anything. These are very collectible, very rare, very hard to come by. You don't see a lot of them. Uh, you won't see them at flea markets, or you'll see. You might catch one at a yard sale. Somebody doesn't know what they have. Uh, you can pass this around and look through the book. Even it's, it's just another collectible book that I have, with a little bit of everything. They're they're a little harder to get, harder to come by, and all of these uh, they have to deal with, uh, with relatives and genealogical people because every bottle was made by somebody, has some connection to some family name. Uh, not just the guy that blew the glass, but the guy that uh, had put the liquid in it, the company that sold it, and their children, and their children, and their children, and uh, there's a lot of history to it. When did they go to some screening? Uh, was that for mass production of bottles then? Rather yeah. than embossing. Yeah, that was that was an easy, it was in, uh, in a more inexpensive way of getting the bottle out faster. And I don't remember exactly when I know they did it in the 50s. I don't know if they did it as early as the 40s or not, where they started putting the painted labels on them. But I know it went through the 50s and 60s. They did it back in the 40s. They were bound to generally the dairy bottles, the pirate glaze bottles for dairy started in the 40s. But generally they were round bottles. Then in the 50s through 60s and 70s, they turned to the square bottles. However, in the 50s, they had a tall neck on the milk bottles, whereas later on, they went to squat with the smaller squat quarts. But they did have pyro in the 40s. It seems to me as time went on, that it got to the point where the packaging of the materials got more costly than the material in the little container. Yeah. So, uh, as an example, I have a couple of glass cardboard in the home. You can't even buy those in glass, but they're plastic. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the cheese boxes are got. Well, everything is collectible. I mean, cheese boxes, wooden cheese boxes are collectible. Milk crates are collectible. Everything's collectible. Yeah. Soda crates, milk crates, the, the old metal ones, the old wooden ones. Um, uh, milk, the, the old metal milk containers they used to put on the porch and put the milk in. The, the milkman would come and put it on your porch and close the lid. They're collectible. Uh, I have one of them. There's not a lot.
lot of them around either. But everything, everything is collectible. There's somebody out there that will pay for everything you have. You know, I, that's, I keep telling my wife, don't throw anything away, but if you ever see my obituary in the paper, <laughs> come through the alleyway, because you can get a lot of good stuff. What's your address? I never threw anything away. My wife said that the garbage men are going to hate her the day I die. <laughs> so you, you'll, find, you'll probably find a 1913 Christy Matthewson baseball card in the garbage. Ooh, garbage. <laughs> <laughs> the pyro started in the 20s and 30s, actually. 20s that early? Yeah. But they didn't do, they probably didn't do a lot of it then. It was mostly slug plates and boss. Because the embossing was more popular, the people liked it, it was, it was more presentable to the public. and. Uh, I, th I think back then they weren't looking for the cheaper way out as much as they were for the, the, the eye-pleasing bottle that the, the housewife would go and buy. So I, I think until they got to the point where the manufacturer could mass produce them in such large quantities that it paid to, to make them, then, then they went really high wild in the 50s and 60s. There's some very interesting bottles. I mean, the, depending, a lot of people specify ones Specific type of bottle. I know, like he, he collects milk bottles. And I collect beer, soda, poison, medicine. That's where you find out caps everything for the milk bottles now. Herb. Caps are hard. I have a. Uh, there's a guy. I think it was. I know the guy in Nixon yeah, City that. that uh, it was a Nixon City Bottling Works. There, there was a lot of them around. I have a couple of them. I have a, label, a couple of the labels, a couple of the caps I have. And then the, the cappers, the, they put the caps on and punch them down in. There's still some of them around. You can find some in the yard sale or flea market. Um, I have lots up in Jessup, too. Yeah? Yeah, all kinds of bottles for so. All kinds. With caps, porch boxes, milk crates, information. Yeah. Anybody have any questions on anything? Uh, just one, well, there, Your one canning jar there, what is that? This is a quick seal. This is uh, 1908, July 14th patented. Uh, there is probably 50, 60, maybe 100 versions of canning jars. Some rare, real rare, some small squat ones, different kinds. This one has a rubber seal wax seals, there's porcelain seals, there's just plain glass seals, um, there, there's, there's lightning, there's, uh, there's hundreds of names, I mean, Ball, there's Ball and Atlas, and Ball is the most common, Atlas is a pretty common one, uh, there's, uh, I think there's one that starts with K-N-O-R-R, K -N -O -R -R, Knorr, uh, there's a Presto, there's, there's so many, lightning is a Rare one. Uh, quick seal is one. Mason was the original. Mason is the biggest one then, by far. Mason, they, that's what they call the Mason jar. That's what they need everything. But there's some that are this big, and, and you can find. I mean, I have a, I have a, uh, a bottle that I found in Germany when they were tearing down the where the convenience store in Germany is now. It used to be a pharmacy there, and I have a bottle that's about this big that big around, but it had like acid or chemicals in it. It was a flat cork bottle, and uh, it was from the pharmacy. And I have one that still got the glass top in it. It's hermetically sealed, and still you can't break that seal. And it, whatever's in it, I'm not, I'm not going to open it. Believe me, it's got something in it shouldn't be out there. <laughs> so it's staying right the way it is. It still has, it's a glass stopper that goes in. That's all it is. It's the bottle in the top is all glass. There's a lot of them. That's the way it was. They were made. Uh, that's an older bottle, 1800s. But uh, I'd have to see the whole the bottle the data. But there's some that you'll find imperfections in the bottles, like like in this here. You can see all the bubbles. Uh, that'll tell you it's there. Guaranteed. That's a, you don't even know have to look for a seam because you know that's made in the 1800s. You can see the little bubbles inside there in the glass. And you'll, you'll see that in some of the other bottles, too, where they have imperfections. You'll definitely see them in bottles like these. You get something like this in the 1800s, you'll see all the little bubbles. Because they just, they just didn't perfect the whole glass back then. 
And they they were trying to make them just as a bottle for to hold something, not as a bottle like like when they were blowing glass to, to make a dish or a bowl or something that one they wanted to be perfect. But a bottle was a container back then. The yeah. thing is, these containers all lived everything that was ever in them, except for the one I have that's home that I don't know what's in. It's a blob top. Yeah, these are blob tops. There's blob tops. There's uh, there's Hutchinson top bottles. There's in fact I wish I brought a couple of the tops with me. I have just brought a couple of little corks that were in them. These are the original corks. This isn't the original cork in this bottle, but it fit good. Where do you get corks? Is this Where can I buy a good selection of corks? I found some at flea markets and yard sales where people had boxes with just cork in it, and I just took some and threw some in there, but uh, they're hard to come by. AC Moore has a really poor selection. I don't. I don't try to replicate. I don't try to replicate anything or put anything new in. But I, I look for original cork that was in the bottle to try to match them up with bottles that I have. That's the only way I'll do it. But I have some of the ceramic tops, the beer tops that go down inside the bottle, and then they have the wire bail over them. I still have. I save the wire bales. I save the little glass insides from the mason jars, from uh, you know the wax seals. I save them. I save the rings. I, I saved everything. What got you interested in collecting bottles? The bottles was by accident. I was digging and I just dug one up and a guy that worked with me was a collector. He was an old Italian that worked with me and he had a couple of bottles he dug sometime and I, when a bottle came up he goes, give me that. And I said, well, if you want it, it must be worth something. So I kept it. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. I was hooked after that. I, anytime somebody offer, wants to take something real quick, you don't give it to them. Is there any way of getting the staining out of some of these bottles on the inside? Uh, I use a bottle brush. Yeah, but some of I use liquid dish detergent and for as much as I can. Uh, is that a there's a lot of action or something <coughs> that, that took place in the glass for the, the well, mistake of the staining out. Depends on what the, what it was stained with. There are some products out there that you that if you get into really heavy bottle collecting, and you'll read in. The best thing to do is get on the mall with in the book section and look up some of the books that are there on collecting. And there's some tips in there on how to get some different stains out of them, and clean them. Like I tried to clean mine almost all the time. I got so I had over a thousand bottles in my house, and my wife just went crazy. I know, I mean, it was room for me and her, me and the bottles, and not her, or me and her, and not the bottles. So I collected the bottles, but then I had to finally get rid of the bottles. In the old days, we just baking soda with that brush. The baking also soda will get, vinegar. yeah, they'll get rid of a lot of things. Uh, vinegar is, is another thing, but there's some other products out there now. Uh, I think some of the ones I've used, I think they're like paste that you can use, uh, and they're very effective on some of the stuff. Some yeah, stains don't ever come off. You know, that CLR is very good. That works good on just about anything, and lime and stuff like that. But some stains just don't come off. Some are embedded in there so bad. I mean, I've worked on bottles and just worked on them finally. I just said they're going on a shelf in the back. I just give up. I said, I hope I find another one that's clean. Some of the, some of the other type of bottles that were value added to the products were, uh, for instance, uh, relishes, ketchup, uh, mayonnaise, and things like that. They made they made them with a top on them that had a slot. So after you got done using the product, you used it as a bank. And those are other bottles that are out there that are uh, collectible. I know I have a couple that were uh, Nash, Nash Mustard, I think it was, that, uh, you know, they have uh, pictures of they're pick their bears, there might be honey in them, yeah. it's a honey bear. Yeah, honey you have to use the honey, then you then you had to top it, you can start saving pennies. Yeah. Yeah. Top, top glasses, had the, top glasses had the, are collectible. The, 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 the old jelly glasses are very collectible right now. The old Flintstone glasses. There's a lot of people looking for those. Even the McDonald glasses. Uh, the giveaway plastic toys that they gave away at McDonald's are very, very collectible right now. Very expensive. I, I I saved every McDonald's toy my kids ever got. I, let, I whenever I go in there, I, if they give me two, I put one in my pocket and one to my son. He play with it. When he got done playing with it, I hide it and then I put it in the attic. His race cars from NASCAR. He bought I bought him the little cars. I play with them a little bit. And when he when he wasn't looking, if it was a rare car that he was playing with and I didn't want him to have it, I'd switch it with another car. If he didn't notice it, he kept going. I put it away. If he did, I have to give it back. But I have some in the in the attic in bags that he doesn't know that I still have in the attic that are from 1991, which is the first real year they made the little NASCAR collectibles. And 
some of them are $150 already for, for a dollar car. Happy Meals, all that stuff. You know what you're. I have I have them in the original. In fact, there's one in my. I don't have the truck here, but I have one in the back seat of my truck that fell out of a box that I was carrying from my camper to my shed so that I go on my vacation in the camper because my camper is my storage that my wife doesn't know about so I'm gone. So I have a shed filled. I have two closets filled. I have a walk-in closet filled, and I have a camper filled. So. Attic. She can't get in the attic, so she'll never know. Married the same girl I am. Everybody's all of them labeled or identified. Oh, she I have I have a pretty good record of a lot of the stuff I have. I don't have every bottle record uh, of every bottle, but I have all the rare ones. Um, I have a Coca-Cola 1923 Coca-Cola bottle, Christmas edition. Like sarsaparilla bottles and the, the Kilmers and the, you know, some of the older stuff, I have all that categorized. And I, like the coins, I have all categorized. The baseball cards, I have pages, pages, upon pages. Well, I, have, I have over a million baseball cards. I don't know what they're worth, but uh, you know somebody that can help you find all value. Well, I do know. <laughs> I, I have nephews that I had, a, I had a little store for a while, so I do know the value of them. But I just I, the value changes. From a lot goes down, a lot goes up. Like a lot of the guys that I had were thirty dollar cards ten years ago are now a two dollar card and a lot of guys that were a two dollar card are now a thirty dollar card. So but uh, I have them from nineteen thirteen up. And I collect books. I have the I have the original Babe Ruth book, the Babe Ruth story, nineteen forty eight, the year the year he died. Uh, I have I have my father's uh, baseball book from Armed services gave to the, the guys in the army. Uh, it was 1943, I think, or 44. It's, it's, a, it's an armed services edition of New York Yankees baseball book. Uh, I have a lot. I, have, I collect a lot of things. I have. Is that your full time job then? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have four jobs. That's this is a hobby. These are all hobbies. I have, I have one full time job. I have three part time. my money. <laughs> but she doesn't collect it. She spends. She only collects it. She's not a long time collector. Long term. You know, she doesn't collect it for very long. It usually comes in out of here and goes to there. And then it's usually some other store gets it. <laughs> but I invested everything I could into, into something that could be worth something What's later. What's the value of your collection? Probably if I put everything together, it's over a hundred thousand oh, dollars. I don't know. I know the baseball cards alone will probably be seventy thousand oh, somewhere around there. But I have the nineteen fifty six Mickey Mantle, which is a, an eighteen hundred dollar card. I have a, the seventy two top set, which is a I think that's a two thousand dollar set. Uh, I, I I have some nice things and then I have some junk caps. Like a wise one sure. Oh yeah, yeah. I have a lot in, in safes, and I have a lot in, in strong boxes and fireproof safes. Uh, I have, you know, like I have stuff that are only valuable to me too. I have stuff that don't have a lot of value, but I would never part with them. I have uh, Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, uh, which my father brought back from World War II. Which, uh, he he told me but he died in eighty. I think it was, and before he died, he told me about one just like it sold in New York for ten thousand dollars. And this is gold embossed all the way around, and it's actually autographed inside, not by Hitler, but by some somebody who gave it to a, it was a mayor of the town, a burgermeister of the town in Germany in 1958. So it's it's a it's a valuable book, and then I have. I collect I collect a lot of books. I have the the Wreck of the Titanic Memorial Edition. Well, uh, that year. I think it was the, it's the year of the wreck. Anyway, it's got a passenger list in the back of all the people around the world. Uh, it's got an embossed cover of the Wreck of the Titanic. It shows the Titanic on the cover. It's a pretty good book to have. And 
I have a lot of first edition books, which are very collectible. I collect books by first editions because they're worth a lot more. I have a few autograph books. Uh, I have one autograph by the president. Uh, I met President Bush a couple, a couple, about two years ago, and I got that autograph. So that's it's a rare autograph that a lot, of, you know, a lot of people might not like President Bush, but uh, just to have a, a book signed by a president is, is something just to, to have. I have books autographed by the author. Uh, one guy just died on Parcel Spence. He just died last year. I have one autographed by him. I have uh, a large collection of pictures, eight by ten pictures of sports figures, mostly baseball, football, NASCAR, uh, probably NASCAR racing. I probably have 150 autographed pictures. And they're worth a minimum of $10 a piece. I mean, for nobody, it's a ten dollar autograph. But I have some of the good ones. I have you know, all the Rusty Wallace's and Mark Martin's and Jeff Gordon's and stuff. So everything's collectible. I mean, there's nothing that you you, just, you can't say. I can probably talk forever on collectibles. I have everything. I have, like I said, I have stamps. My father got me collecting stamps when I was a kid. I have Boy Scout patches. Boy Scout patches are very, very collectible. Worth a lot of money. Do you have any chess of postcards you want to sell? Chess of postcards? Uh, I'll look and see, but I don't think so. I, I, didn't, have, I, didn't, got, I, I didn't get a lot of local postcards. I got a lot of national postcards. I got a lot of Easter postcards, Christmas, Valentine's Day, uh, holiday ones, some 1800s that are raised in Boston. I have a lot of the older ones. So there, there are some postcards that are worth $100, $150. I'm looking for the Dixon City Dairy. Dixon City Dixon Dairy, City Milk Dairy and Peck Dairy. Mm -hmm. what I have. I Let me know what you need. <laughs> I don't need any. <laughs> 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 I have milk crates upon milk crates upon milk crates full of bottles and soda cases upon soda cases full of bottles and I, like I said I had a th over a thousand at one time and I started selling some off just to make room for more and then I, when I started selling them then I found some more and started collecting some more. I, just, I have them behind the furnace. I have them on shelves and behind the furnace and they're all covered with dust. I don't even go back and look at them. Occasionally I'll hear a glass break and I know well, something vibrated from the furnace and went a little close to the edge. And this might be a lot of questions. Obviously, there are a lot of questions here, but can you suggest a way of finding somebody reliable to evaluate the budget of bottles and possibly purchase them? When we bought our property 30 some years ago, it was an old dump over the hill. At that time, we dug out a lot of bottles. And the old Allen house was filled with wine bottles. So yeah, I'll do old wine bottles. But um, we, have, we still have a lot of them. I know there's a lot more down there that we've never gone back to, to dig up. But before my husband throws me out of the house with all the bottles. Where was your dump? Where was your Montel. There's the Montel dairy bottles I already promised to home. I don't need any of them. I need the rest of them. I need Capitas brothers from Montel. You know, I haven't looked at them. I mean, I moved this bo these bottles. I'll, buy, I'll buy any milk bottles. <laughs> I know there's some milk bottles that have the, you know, the cream tops. I know there's some of those. That's good. Yeah, that's that's good. good. I think we got a bush for a bottle. The cream is for us. My daughter is married to it. Like my daughter and my sister is married to it. I only have one, but I'm buying the cream in the Yeah, in front of the WPA wall, two miles from the dairy. Ellen Cure was up there. El Rancho yeah. Adolphus, Montville <laughs> Farm Dairy, Bush Coast. I have a lot of Bush Coast for sale. Everybody needs Bush Coast. Oh, oh, you had the Herbs Farm. That's his. Oh, okay. in, answer, in answer to your question, uh, there's not a lot of bottle oh, dealers oh, are. around. Uh, as far as finding out the value of them, I can give you a, a rough idea. Nick Batula can probably give you a little bit better idea. I can, I can probably get you in touch with him. He's, he's very knowledgeable, stays on top of it a lot more than I do because I collect so many things that I can't do what he specifies just in bottles. And 
he's a very honest, very <coughs> reputable guy, uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, he can probably give you a good idea of what the value is, and then the best thing to do would be either contact one of these bottle collectors' associations, bottle clubs. Um, they have shows. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> if you got somebody local that wants to buy them, I mean. Hey, I did. This 
is an old medicine bottle. You notice about the medicine bottles, the way they made them, is the, the companies that made the medicine made them with a shape so that they appeared to be a bottle, but the inside was so narrow and thin that they've got very little medicine in it. But they made, they made you think that the, we were getting a full bottle, but they narrowed them in the center so that the, the fluid went down and went around the outsides and just covered a very thin spot part of the center. And that's how they fooled people into thinking they were getting more of what, the, what they were getting. What kind of medicine was in that, Bruce? Uh, this is F. F.A.D.R. Riker Company. That's a bottle. That, that was for a bottle. It's from New York. Yeah. Some of the bottles like that were bottles. It, it, it doesn't bombing. say what it was, but it's... Uh, Riker, Riker was famous for a bottle. A lot of those were buried right in cemeteries. Yeah. I didn't dig any cemeteries. <laughs> Are you sure? I didn't know that. I didn't find any bones anyway. Well, what they did was they threw them right in the caskets. So when, they, when they bombed people, they threw them in the bottles. That's how else we got rid of their garbage somehow. They would throw it right in the casket. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, I know there was a lady that lived right next to me when I was growing up. I, I was very good friends with her son. We were the same age, went to school together. And she's a big collector. Her house is like a museum. She's got to be up in her 80s by now, easily. And she used to take a wagon every day after the kids would go to school. She'd take a wagon and go up to the woods. She'd go up to the old German dump and she'd start digging. She'd come back with a wagon full of bottles. She'd clean them up. And then she she put them in her windows for display, all colored ones. And uh, she found the typical new bitters bottles. They were worth about a thousand dollars each back when she was collecting them in the seventies. Was that was that was she like two of them? Yeah. She found three of them up there, and she used that to, to those bottles is what sent her kids to college. She sold them, and she sell she collects everything. It's uh, I don't know if you you would know them, the Baranskas up on Bacon Street. Oh, I remember them. She, she, she used to take a wagon every day and go up in the woods and dig. And, and I, I mean, I went up there as late as two, three years ago and found bottles. There's still stuff up there, but she cleaned it out. I mean, she went through that whole place. <laughs> <laughs> she got all the good stuff. It was like the city dump. It was the borough dump. Yeah, every, every town had their own dump. Every town had a dump. A lot of houses had their own dump in the backyard. Like, uh, if you were on the far side of town, East German, where the woods were close behind you. Every house there had their own dump in their backyard. Um, like the people in the center of the town didn't have that luxury because they had a little flat backyard, so everything got put in the ash tubs and carried up the woods. And uh, you know, back then they had probably horse and buggies that picked up their garbage and took it up and dumped it in the woods. And that's that. The old German dump is right where the new development is being built up in the back of German. And there's still bottles there. Uh, if you know where your town dump is or was, uh, I can tell you the one in Oliphant in here is right over where they built the baseball fields. I, I, in fact, I got a milk bottle sitting on my swing at the house that I didn't get a chance to clean yet. I was jogging and I was running through the, the path around the Oliphant field. And uh, when I was going through, I looked over and I seen glass shining. So I said, wait a minute, I'm going off the trail. So I ran off the trail and there was a milk bottle sitting right on top. Picked it up, rubbed it up a little bit, cleaned it, carried it on the rest of my run back home and took it home with me. And I was tempted to go back and start digging, but I didn't have enough time. The four jobs and everything else keeps me kind of busy. The Peckville dump is where they're put. Right now they're building a new Peckville assembly. You got on the six. That's where the Peckville dump up on the highway? Yeah, well, that was the second that little pump. Yeah. So it's a little bit newer. The old one was behind the football stadium, but that development was put in the 60s, so everything's out of there. There's two dumps in Germany, too. That that dump in Oliver, where you're talking about, where they still filling that field. I was running through there myself, and I stopped, and I was a big, big in there. And you know what she was showing me? She was showing me all, she was showing me artifacts, especially records. I guess especially all that for a lot of their dumping towns. A lot of slugs of uh, vinyl over there in that section that they're digging up. I guess especially since you know a lot of their, their uh, you'll find some stuff. Inter yeah, interesting like things things when you're like, digging. Like little snakes and stuff. Like when you're not even digging for, like, if you're not even looking for bottles, if you're just digging in, a, in some of these old dumps, you'll find uh, old toys, lead soldiers, marbles, uh, plastic, a lot of collectible plastic toys like the old cars and the old figurines and salt and pepper shakers and things like that that people just threw in. I found cups and saucers and salt shakers and ceramic.
toys, lead soldiers, marbles. I found all kinds of things in them. I just throw them in jars and just keep right on going. If anyone needs, I have a list of five counties in Pennsylvania volunteers that we know of. That we know of. We're not going to need to know them all, but we have a catalog of five counties. Glenn White, Nick Petula is one of Glenn White's friends who helped put him with the book. As well as three or four other guys, including uh, Rex Thompson, who owned Thompson's Dairy Bar, and has passed away since. That's why it's important to get the information out there. Yeah. Find as much, find out as much as possible now before the people who actually remember the facts pass on, yeah. when we can't get them. And that's why we, we formed this historical society we have, so that we can get all the information about everything in Germany, where the stores were, who owned them, what they sold, where they made the horseshoes. In fact, I found a horseshoe in Germany while I was running. They could just run along the road in the, in the curb where they had the concrete curbs. They had the metal bars that went through there, and somebody hit one of the curbs, and when they did, they broke up the concrete. A, a, an old horseshoe was stuck in the concrete. I was running, I was jogging home, I went down, I went through. Like that, and there I go, run along with a horseshoe man. So I went home with another horseshoe. I have, I have probably ten horseshoes in the house, too. I have old tools, I have chains, I have I have a lot of collectible stuff. I don't even know what I have. I have, I have the barrels that nails used to come in, the wooden barrels with the, with the uh, metal rings around them. With the, a lot of them still have the nails in them. They have the old spikes that don't even look like nails. Um, there's not much I don't collect. I could probably start a museum myself. <laughs> Maybe I should. Maybe then I'll, my wife would be happier. Yeah. Well, I could put a show on. I could. I, I, I have quite a bit. I started collecting NASCAR stuff because I love. I always loved racing, and uh, now I have. I have tires, NASCAR tires. I have glove nuts off cars. I have a piston out of a car. I have. I have the, the Unical gasoline uh, flags that were around the gas pumps at the racetrack. I have the Winston Cup flags that went around the garage area at the racetracks. I have Budweiser signs off the guardrails at Watkins Glen. I have a fender off the front of a car, <coughs> autographed by the driver. You have a very patient life. <laughs> Do you have any lists of uh, catalogs of beer companies and soda companies in the area? For instance, in Carbonell, you had Falls Dairy or Falls? Falls. The, the Fell Brewing is one of the, the very largest collectibles there are in the area because they're very, very especially the, the beer trays. From Frank Yeager in Forest City is looking for Fells. Yeah, I have a Fell. I have a couple of Fell bottles. I did that book on brewery. Because uh, if you look in Cubbills or any of our yeah, it have national, it has very few local bottles. No, it doesn't have the local Dairy, stuff. beer, soda, anything. We have some stuff here that's probably more valuable than we know because it's rare to us. But people in other areas don't collect it. They only collect national stuff. So a lot of local stuff would be very valuable if we could catalog it and put it together. It would be nice if we could get some people together and do something like that. eBay has a lot of our stuff. I just saw David Hutchinson for sale from Dunmore with a harp or with a star on it and it sold for eight dollars. You can find a lot of that stuff in eBay because a lot of people moved out of this area and took a lot of stuff with them. I know Tom, you, you, you buy stuff on eBay all the time. You get it from Texas and California and Michigan and, and uh, you know, we, people just moved out of the area, they packed up their belongings and took stuff with them. They took antiques and they took whatever their family had years ago and moved away. So now they, their children are getting them saying, what's this, you know, you don't know where this place even is, and they just throw it on eBay and sell it. So that happens a lot. So I mean, you, you can get stuff locally from our area on eBay for people in California and Washington and Oregon and Montana and any place else. I mean, people that travel all over and just move out of the area. But I'd be glad to help anybody with anything as far as collectibles, I'm finding out what, you're, what you have. I have a Bible collection. Do I have a Bible that's this big? I have one that's this big, a miniature Bible, and then I have one that's this big, embossed, a gold on the side with the embossing on the top. And that's our family Bible. It was brought over from England in the 1800s. Uh, I have Bibles from the 30s and 20s and 40s and 
fifties and seventies and there's not much I don't collect. If it's but something that's collectible I'll give the troop story more more items or like uh yeah. Yeah, yeah they, I, have, I, have, I have I have a couple of more colors. Yeah, the, the, the Army supplied the, the soldiers, you know, the Marines and the Navy, everything with stuff to keep them occupied and, and uh, Bibles for some of the things they gave them. And they're collectible because they're already 70, 80 years old. And uh, I have, in fact, I have an Armed Services book. There's a Navy book that I have, and it shows all the enemy warplanes and how to tell what they look like. And it, it was given to the people in the Navy so they could recognize which ones were ours and which ones were theirs. And has the bottom insignias of the planes and the side insignias on the planes so you can tell what, what you know nation was coming after you. <laughs> but there's so much to collect. I mean, I, you know, I don't know how anybody could not have a collection of some kind. I, mean, I have marbles also and jar full of marbles. I have uh, campaign buttons, I have political buttons, I have fire company, a couple of fire companies. I save a little bit of everything. I don't have a lot of everything. I do have a little bit of everything. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I have. I have tins, like, uh, the old candy tins, some of them, that stuff I used. My grandfather used to store his nuts and bolts in, but they're not they're collectible now. They, they're they're yeah. put aside too. They're, everything is collectible. I mean, you don't find people selling stuff at the flea market every day. Anything else? Anything, any other questions? Glad to help you with anything. Baseball cards is my main collectible. I, I know more about that than anything. So if you had any questions on anything like that, I could help you with. Uh, I have bats. I have little league bats. I have one very, very rare little league bat that I can't even find the price on. The little league museum doesn't even have it. It's a Mickey Mantle little league bat. It's uh, I call it Williamsport. They don't have one. This was made in Homer, New York, by the Comet Bat Company. He was called the Commerce Comet, the thing that Mickey Mantle was in. They don't, Blue League doesn't have one, but it's a Blue League right on it. That's, that I know is worth something. I have one with Willie Mays, I have one with Pete Rose, one with Willie McCovey. Everything's collectible. I have a, net, a Hall of Fame bat that's probably worth a few hundred dollars. It was, I think, $150 when it was issued. But they only made 500 every year when the Hall of Fame was induction ceremony. I have one of those from 1986. I have baseball gloves. I have, I forgot about them. I have old baseball gloves signed. You know, that's with, not signed, but they're embossed with the name of the player. I have some a lot of guys that I knew, Reggie Jackson, guys from the 50s and 60s. So I, have, I probably have eight or ten baseball gloves. I have old masks, catcher's masks, umpires, chest protectors. I have golf clubs, wooden golf clubs. <coughs> David, I probably have something. Do you have that old iron? Yeah, why? I was pushing that. Iron? No, I don't have sugar. I might have one. I might. Because I, I do remember having one at one time. I don't think I still do. I have a bullet from the Civil War. Uh, I have an Indian tool from when the Indians used to scrape the, their leather you know, when they were making things. I, I, up in Tunkhannock, I was digging there with the archaeologists from when they were putting the, the, the bypass in. You wouldn't believe the stuff up there. I, I love history, and I went nuts up there. But they, they had the wrong guy up there when they had me on the machine. I wasn't interested in digging. I was interested in what they were doing. But, uh, I I was, you have a burglar alarm in your house. Well, I, used to, I used to have a Cocker Spaniel. That was my burglar alarm. But my wife doesn't leave the house so much, so she, she's, she's got a bark to her, too. <laughs> Anything else? I could talk all day. <laughs> yeah, you got you know you know a little bit about NASCAR. What would you what would your ballpark estimate be on you know the Richard Petty car, the model, in cellophane, signed by Richard Petty? Well, that's a hundred and fifty dollar minimum. I guess the autograph is worth that much. I, I was uh, the car itself has probably got a forty or fifty dollar value on it. So you're talking one hundred fifty to two hundred. That's just well, Dale Earnhardt would not sign for me. I walked right up to him with a picture and went, Mr. Earnhardt, could I have your autograph? And he just went, walked right My cousin worked on the wrecking crew up at Pokemon. 
I didn't tell him I was a bear. I should have. I probably should have told him I was a bear. But he, uh, I had a Rusty Wallace hat and a Rusty Wallace shirt. Uh, <laughs> that didn't go over too good either. Probably if I had a Dale Earnhardt shirt on, I could have got his autograph. That's the only autograph I didn't get. I, I got Ernie Irvin. I got uh, Mark Martin, Dale Jarrett, Kenny Wallace, Mike Wallace, Rusty Wallace, Morgan Shepard, Sterling Marlin, Kyle Petty, Richard Petty, uh, all the Wood Brothers, when the Wood Brothers were, I have a program from 1974 for Pocono, it's the original year that they raced at Pocono. I have the Schaefer 500 program from when the Indy cars first came to Pocono. And I don't know anybody else that has one of those. I don't even know how you can remember right now. I have Heidi's book on my shelf, I remember looking right there that it says Heidi in it. I always mad about that because the Raiders were playing football when the movie came on. They cut, <laughs> they cut into my football game and I didn't see the end of it. <laughs> Alice, you want to wrap it up? Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else want to buy tickets on our little raffle? What are we giving away today? We're giving away um, Hallmark ornaments. They're the little 2005 oh. trains. Oh, well, my wife wins. Two of them. Oh, very good. Here's what it is. Oh, who's got it? I got it. Here's what we're raffling off. Is that collectible, by the way? Yeah, they are. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're all right. Is this a collectible? Yeah. 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 Oh, no. Okay. Right. <laughs> Someday I'm going to sell everything, so if you're interested, let me know. I looked at my own muscles in here, but that's why I come over with the Sundays and stuff. Well, I'm going to call it a little bit. Oh, yeah. You see a lot of stuff. Don't I still have a big game up there? Long game and stone and everything from up there. Just below big and money are in the big stuff. I have books from 1860s, leather, leather covered books. Uh, I have school books from the early I have baby, children's books, baby books. I have stuff. I have uh, Shirley Temple book. I don't even know why I collect stuff. stuff. I, have I have no interest in it. I looked at that one German director Bible for me right away, 1885. Oh, Alice, who's going to pull? Who's going to pull it out? I have 30 copies of 1893 papers. I don't know, first you want to pull the tickets? Well, I got one in there, I don't want to pull that. Somebody doesn't have one. <laughs> I just bought some. Everybody has yeah. one. Yeah, just bought it. Throw it up in the air. Where's George? Bruce, go ahead. Here, here, here. You pull. Here's about the other one that doesn't have one. We'll let her pull. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Five six four. I know you do with baseball. I have everything. I have a library in my house. All the wall bookshelves is nothing but old books. And I read them. I have the history of the, of the Lackawanna Valley. The history that's learned is mentioned in the Lackawanna Valley. I have, I have papers with the old Indian Let me give you an envelope here. I have a there was none through German that were major. They only put the big major ones in there. They, they went down the hard some of them through Waverly and up that way to New York. But there were Indians in the Lackawanna Valley. We don't have we don't have a lot of record of where their past was. They lived all over. I mean, if it wasn't so mine scarred where they dug everything we could find in the artifacts, they they ruined everything. The mines. What kind of tribes lived here? Seneca, the Muncie tribe. Uh, there was actually three different tribes that lived in this area. And Seneca is a little bit more to New York State. In fact, I have the Seneca.
No, there's a guy, that, uh, I'll tell you what, there's a guy that works for Lane's Green, a big watch box collector. Uh, I can't think of his name right now. He's one of the biggest. He has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Where's this from? There's a lot of people that collect them. Belt buckles, watch bobs, buckles and straws, tie tip, tie, tie pins, uh, watches, clocks. There's a guy in Montdale that has a house. If you walk in that house, there's got to be a thousand clocks on his wall. You can't tell what time it is because they're all different. And I walk in and say, what time is it, Don? I don't know. Every, every room has different times, different clocks. He has every kind of clock you can think of. Clocks and radios. Clock radios. He has the old plastic radios. He has the wooden radios. He has the phonographs. The needles that crank up. And this guy, guy him, he's, a, he's an eccentric old guy, and he, and he, he loves his play. He has a big, big log cap, probably a three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and it's loads from one end to the other. But nothing but different kinds of clocks and radios. And that's his, that's his niche. That's what he collects. He doesn't collect anything else. Doesn't have an interest. He collects watches, clocks, and radios. Everybody collects something. I'd be glad to come and talk to you anytime or bring in, you know, if you want me to bring in something, I can bring in books, I can bring in baseball cards, I can bring in magazines. I have life magazines, I have old sports illustrated magazines, old times magazines. No, because I took stuff over there and I never got anything for it. I've known John Sapple since he was a young boy. No, it's just that the clientele that I hope I have to used to come there when they first opened and they weren't willing to pay for anything. The only, the only box. They, 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 if there was, if you bring something that's very valuable and rare, and there might only be one person there that wants to buy it. And nobody bids against it. Everybody for nothing. So if you put it in there and say whatever you get for it, you get for it. I took up a computer back when computers were weren't like they are now, where they throw. I gave a printer, a computer, a keyboard, the mouse, and everything worked. And I got 50 cents. I, I took about 20 items in and got about six dollars for 20 items. And I never went back. But I mean, he does have some good stuff, and, and it's a good place to buy. It's not a good place to sell. Auctions. Sometimes you can get lucky. You, know, you find two or three or four people that are interested in your item. They bid against each other. You can get lucky and get a high price. But if you go into an auction and it's not a specific auction where, like, a base, you do a baseball card auction, you go to baseball cards, you can get a good price because everybody that's there is a baseball card collector. But an auction like John has, where it's a little bit of new stuff, a little bit old stuff, a little bit of maybe a gun here and a coin there, we might only have one gun collector. Yeah. So that gun is only going to be worth what that guy's going to be willing to pay. That's a good auction to buy from my buddy. Because you have a lot of people bidding, and then you, you can't sell stuff there, you have to donate stuff. You know, so that's the of an auction. But uh, like an auction like this here, if you if he just would specify baseball cards and advertise the baseball card auctions, just have baseball cards, that's how I would bring baseball cards to sell. Because then you know you got dealers and collectors. So the dealers are going to go to a certain price that yeah. they'll pay so that they can resell it to the one. The collectors will go a little higher if it's something that they want. You know, if it's not something they want, they're not going to pay it. So it's all supply and demand. That's the way that every industry is collecting it the same way. I could have only one of these bottles, but if nobody wants to buy it, there might only be one of these in the world. But if I don't find that one guy that wants this bottle, I can't sell it. It's not worth anything to anyone. But you could have a hundred of these bottles and have a hundred collectors that want it and you can get more money for a bottle than you have hundreds. You got a hundred people that say, oh, I want that bottle, this car. I just like that car. It's 
it all depends on who wants to buy, buy what you have. You but there is a buyer for everything. There's a collector for Some people are willing to pay more than others. Some people aren't. Some people have the, the means to buy more than others. I mean, I, I always try to get it by buy. There's a guy up the top of the hill here in Oliver that collects nothing but beetles. He has a room. He has a room as wide as this room. And probably almost half this length. And it is completely filled with beetles. Beetles. No, the, uh, the music, musician. The musical. He has every album he ever made. There was 50, 50 versions of 18 different albums. He has every single thing in there. He has lunch tables, he has dolls, he has a baseball cards, a posters. I think the thing is, he just bought a bicycle. He bought a bicycle. I don't know what he paid for that. He bought it on, on eBay. But he, he is, he's got the largest sales collection I've ever seen. He has everything, everything you can think of. In magazines, books. I, I mean, I have 10 or 12 or 4. I have a great Bozak Chuck, one from Oliver and I have 25 and it's all the album. Five. 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 Seventy-eights are a little harder to sell this around here, but they're easy to sell in New York and California. You know, you're, you're talking the old Glenn Miller stuff and Sinatra and all that. You can sell them there around here. You know, there's a guy in Germany who used to have a power and he was involved in the flood that we had. Well, he died. Frank Nazi. The, fa the father died. They owned it before the flood, but the son kept them. He had them in the basement. And he had to throw them all away. And, and Frank, the, the old guy, he collected every record you could think of. He had thousands in the, in the bo boxes, in the books. They're all gone. All gone. He threw them all in the dumpsters. But he'll collect. If you have anything with Beatles, he'll buy it, whether it's good or not. I mean, and if you have Beatles, then, you know, I, I mean, I'd be interested. I, I might put myself just to collect them. I want to try to get the collection that I had when I was a kid back. That's how I started with baseball cards. The, the way I started, 19, well, I had the collection when I was a kid. My grandmother came all the way. So I lost them. I had Tonka toys and all the toys. My grandmother gave them all away. I would, everything I had when I was a kid was given away. So I had to start all over again after I got married. So that's been an ongoing thing since we, I got married. So I collected them. But in 1980, my son was born. In 85, I went to the store across the street. He was five years old. I walked in. They had baseball cards. Tops baseball cards. So I bought them a pack. I opened them up and I smelled the gum. The gum smelled just like it did when I was a kid, so I said, here, try this gum, this is really good. And he spit it out, he didn't like it. So I, I looked at the cards, and there was like seven or eight cards in the pack, and there was one good player in the pack, so I went through it, and pulled a good player out, and handed him the cards, and said, here, here's some baseball cards. So he walked out across the street, and I looked at the card, and I went, wait a minute, let's go back in, I went in about five more packs. And I went in, I wanted the gum, so I said, I ate the gum. And then I went through and I did the same thing. I picked all the good players out, gave him all the rest. And I saved the wrappers. I, I saved everything. I saved the boxes, the wrappers. I have a, a box from 1971. That's it's just an empty box. The cards went in. And it's worth like $25, $30 for an empty cardboard box with this print on it. Uh, that's how I got started collecting baseball cards again. I, I just I can remember that smell, and then I, I started looking at the players, and then I got in. I was always a baseball fan, so I was interested in it. So I went down to the flea market the next Sunday, and there was a guy selling baseball cards there. And I just walked in, I bought a few packs, and I said, How much do you know? And he had a box, how much do you know? And he gave me a price, and so I took the whole box, I took the box home, I started opening them, but I was looking there. They were still the same as I was a kid, they had numbers on the back to make a set out of them. So I said, well, I'll make a set. So I started making a set. I went back and bought another box the next Sunday. So I, could, I could complete the set the first week. So I went back, I completed the set, bought a box. And then I said, well, that's 1985. Said, How much for an 84 set? He had set, so I bought an 84 set. So then I said, well, I'm going to go back and get a set back to the year my son was born. I'll put him away for it. 
So I went back about three, a couple weeks later, about 82, a couple weeks later, I went back and I paid a few more dollars than I wanted to, but I bought 81 and then I bought 80 because every year I had a few more than two rookie stars to make the set worth a little bit more. The first that I bought, I think I paid $24, and the second one I accepted was $20. Well, that's too much money, and now that sets to $150. You know, I bought sets for $10 and $12, and they were $1,000. That Mickey Mantle card, I got $20, so I only went for $1,800. So I paid $20 for the first set, and then I paid $20 for the well we have a lot of